Hi, everyone, and welcome to another episode of Yeshiva League Pass Faceoff. I'm your host, Josh Cass. And before we begin, I just want to remind you all who we're sponsored by, and that is the Weiselberg Law Firm. For 16 years, you've entrusted Elliot with the growth and guidance of your kids, and now it's time to let him do the same thing for your family's most important asset, your home. Admitted in both New York and New Jersey, Elliot can help guide you through any residential or commercial purchase, sale, refinance, or lease with championship quality and award-winning care. If you're looking for your commercial coach or a new home is your goal, reach out to the Weiselberg Law Real Estate Services today at 917-952-2597. You can send them an email, just email wiselawesk at gmail.com. Reminding everybody, once again, that's the Weiselberg Law Firm. Please choose wisely. Back in action here. It is our sixth episode of the season. The last thing we put out was the JV season recap. Today, we are moving to the varsity level and doing a varsity season recap. So without further ado, let's get right into it again. Similar to the way that I did JV, where we worked our way towards the bottom or rather from the bottom towards the top. We're going to go again from the bottom towards the top. Varsity was a bigger league than the JV one was. So hopefully we'll get it done in relatively the same amount of time. But uh, I encourage you guys to stick around because this is going to be a great journey. So we're going to start in the Western Conference because there were two conferences. In the Western Conference, the order of the regular season standings were as follows. And we'll go now from top to bottom. We had TABC in first. Frisch in second, Kushner in third, MTA in fourth, SAR was fifth, Orisrael sixth, JEC was seventh, and Hilla was eighth. In the Eastern Conference, we had DRS in first place, Hank in second, Hafter in third, Mag and David in fourth, Rambam in fifth, Flapush in sixth, YDE in seventh, North Shore in eighth, and Solomon Schechter in ninth. So more teams by one in the Eastern Conference than there were in the Western and that amounts to a total of 17 teams. There were only nine in the JV League, and there weren't even two divisions. It was just one big division, one league as a whole. In the Western, or excuse me, in the Varsity League, we had two conferences, so to speak. The Western teams more really for the Jersey schools, the Manhattan schools, all that stuff, and the Eastern Conference for the teams more on the Long Island side, Brooklyn side of things. So, We're going to start in the Western Conference. In the Western Conference, we'll begin with Hillel, and you know we'll tie JC. You'll do this. Remember, the point of this was really to see sort of where these teams fell out in the end during the regular season, as we thought they might when we made early season predictions. When I shot that episode with Avi Don Berman, and we put these teams into categories. So Hillel and JC, really, really both of them were in the same boat. Hillel finished with a record of one and thirteen. JC finished with with a record of two and eleven. And although I know that 2-11 and doesn't add up to 14, they just didn't end up playing another game. Why? I don't know. Um, But either way, finished with a record of 2-11 and for JC and and 1-13 for Hill. These teams were really in the same boat. And at the end of the day, they really just didn't have a lot to compete with teams that were above them in the standings like SAR, like Frisch, like Kushner, just to name a few random teams in their own conference and teams like Rambam and Hafter, Hank, you know, in the Eastern Conference. So, you know, really just not so much to look forward, but, you know, they really played hard all season long and they played with a lot of pride. And despite the fact the record didn't indicate, you know, really the success that they ended up having during the regular season, I think that, you know, considering that these are two relatively new teams back at least in hockey because they have had teams in the past, um, you know, uh, just, you know, you're never going to wow everyone right off the rip, but, you know, you know, maybe give it another year, another year or two. And, uh, you know, we can see them definitely playing more competitive hockey. I definitely would not put it past these teams. Uh, as for Ori Sroyal, Ori Sroyal, the team that finished right above those two uh, with a record of four and nine, we're sniffing the playoffs towards the middle to middle end of the regular season, but ultimately couldn't get wins when they really needed them. Remember that most of their players were not the seniors that uh, are really just not seniors that we're used to seeing. They had really a younger team because they did have a JV team last year that was predominantly ninth grade. Uh, do want to shout out, though, um, that some of their younger players are really phenomenal. You've got PTAC, you've got Abramson, you've got Froman, all those guys on the younger side who are really going to help carry that squad going forward. They'll be an interesting team to look at next year when those guys are playing on the varsity level as varsity aged guys. These were guys who helped step up and 
give them some real good play this year and, you know, put them through some really good battles. Um, you know, so it's an interesting core three to look at for the two seasons that they'll have left coming forward as they're only 10th graders now. So it'll be definitely interesting to look out for. Uh, as for SAR and MTA, SAR finished with a record of seven and seven. MTA finished with a record of seven, six and one. They were right around the same area, as you can see in points, wins, losses, all of that stuff. Uh, MTA and SAR were pretty much neck and neck all season long. Both of these teams, it didn't really end so well for them in the playoffs. SAR went on the road and beat Mag and David, but then lost to TABC in the quarterfinals. MTA hosted Rambam in the wild card game, as that's what we were calling before, uh, but lost five nothing. Uh, on the back end of a brilliant performance by Zevi Herskowitz, who scored all five goals in that game for Rambam. I'll get there when I get to Rambam. Uh, but, you know, they did have good regular seasons, got into the playoffs, both had a chance to, you know, get to the conference finals. SAR did, MTA didn't. Um, ultimately, neither of these teams advanced farther than the conference finals at most. So with that being said, tough point, it, you know, tough ending, but both of these teams have a lot of young talent. They will certainly be back here, or I, I would assume, and I think it would be safe to assume, especially based on JV from two seasons ago, when next year's varsity teams will be the ones that mirror last year's, not this past year's, but the year before it's JV's teams. Uh, it'll definitely be something interesting to watch. Both SAR and MT were very good on the JV level, not this past season, but the season before, um, or at least I wasn't talking about this past season. Uh, you've already seen that. Um, and if you haven't, go check it out. Uh, with that being said, we'll move on to Kushner and Frisch, and they finished in second and third, respectively. Kushner in third, Frisch in second. Kushner finished nine and five. Frisch finished ten and four. The two teams split the regular season meetings. They played twice: once in Frisch, once in Kushner. Kushner won in Kushner. Frisch won in Frisch. With that being said, both of these teams were rock solid. Had great production from players. If we're gonna sort of compare and contrast, Kushner's a much uh, thinner team than Frisch Frisch with a lot more depth, a lot more bodies. You know, they've been around a little bit longer in terms of their window for being competitive roughly just about every year. This is their third consecutive year going at the very least to the semifinals since the league has sort of resumed after COVID had stopped it. And you look at their last three years, a championship win, a championship appearance and a semifinal appearance to the team that won it all in DRS, which I'll get to them soon. But can't really be disappointed with the season that you had if you're Frisch. And they really did lose a lot of firepower as for what they had the previous year when they had guys like Jason Alter, Jakey Fight, Ellie Knapp, Ben Srolowitz, you know, Andrew Srolowitz and Nett. And guys really stepped up big time this year. Guys who were sort of depth players for them last year as juniors who were the senior class guys from this year. Guys like Charlie Hilbert, Tall Glassman both stepped up on the offensive side of things. Great defensive play. They got some additions from guys who were playing ice hockey and transitioned to play for like Max Levy and David Rosen who played offense also for them. Uh, who was absolutely outstanding. And in net, Akiva Rotenberg stepping up from the JV level onto the varsity level, starting as a junior, he was phenomenal for them all year. And ultimately, I think that the team has a very bright future. As for Kushner, again, I mentioned not a deep team, but lots of talent also on the younger side. Now, they are going to lose some pieces. They're going to lose guys like Sam Steiner and Sean Felderman, who were two key seniors on that team. But they'll have Simon Rosenfeld in net for next year. James Orbach, who's one of the top juniors in the league, is going to be back at it again next year. Kobe Eisenberg stepping up big time again. They're going to have some interesting pieces there for sure. And I just listed off one in each position, one in goaltend, one in the goaltender position. You've got Simon Rosenfeld on offense. You've got James Orbach on defense. You've got Kobe Eisenberg, three of the individually best players at each of their respective positions, if not the best at each of their respective positions. And with that being said, it's a good way to, for them to realize that they have these three guys to build around. I think that they will be an interesting team next year. Certainly would not put it past them to be able to compete. They definitely have potential to do that. Question is, can they put it all together? Maybe if they get a transfer student here and there, or if they have improvement from other players. I'm not saying that there's no one else on this team that can perform. Maybe if role guys step up, though, a little bit more, along with the great play that those three players individually can bring and make them, you know, they make those around them better. That's another part to their game. Now that they'll be playing against varsity guys as a varsity age, because the other thing you need to remember is that these guys who I just mentioned in Orbach, Rosenfeld and Eisenberg specifically have been playing varsity really since the start. They did play JV in ninth grade, but in 10th grade, got the opportunity, competed hard on the varsity level against 
teams that I would say the league was much deeper in. So they had tougher competition to face. Um, it's nothing against anyone in this league. It's not a knock on this year's league. It's really just the fact of the matter that they have a little more experience, I think, than most other guys their own age do having played varsity because most guys only have this, this past season that we just played. And those three guys, as I mentioned, for Kushner, Orbach, Eisenberg, and Rosenfeld all played in their 10th grade year on the varsity level as well and all got time, not just were on that roster, but all got time. So they'll be interesting to look at going forward. Finally, that brings us towards the top team in the Western Conference finished in the regular season, and that is TABC. TABC went 12-2 and on the regular season. There are only two losses coming to Frisch, in Frisch, and to DRS at DRS. They were a powerhouse, and I said when I announced at the championship game, this team is absolutely loaded with talent, or rather was now, it's past tense, but you know, guys all the way up and down the lineup, guys on the front end, guys on the back end, on offense, you had, you know, very possibly, well, not very possibly, uh, the four best, but four of the best for sure uh, in terms of individual forwards. And they played so well together, guys like Matis Kraus and Shea Fields on the senior side of things. And they had great production from the juniors as well. Guys like Aiden Rausman, Ben Sion Kaiser, Akiva Mattel, Noam Becker were all a part of the mix. And then on defense, really a majority uh, a majority junior class. You had guys like R.A. Simon and Jonathan Brofman playing on that top line. R.A. Izekovitz was playing heavy minutes for them. Also a guy in the mix like Ethan Moskov, who was fantastic for them. Max Borger, comeback player, really had a great season. Unfortunately, had to step out early in the championship, but he had a nice turnaround after missing the first three years, one to COVID, the next two due to tearing his ACL. And it was really just a shame because the kid really deserved to be able to play more. Um, but, you know, for what he was able to accomplish and how far he came this year and even, you know, getting to take a shift or two in the championship really just showed the kid was all about working and uh, really just you know, amazing work on his part. It's just, you know, it's just an unfortunate situation that he had to exit that game early. And, you know, I don't want to discount the guys who sort of flew under the radar, as most people would say, because you mentioned all those top heavy guys from TABC, but don't want to leave guys off the board like Ari Herman and Ezra Alter, who were fantastic for them playing more depth roles, so to speak, and guys who might have necessarily been on the depth chart, so to speak, as like third line players, but were able to play with first line guys, were able to play against every other first line. They were really right up there with the rest of other teams' top players. It really just shows how deep this TABC team was. And then in net, obviously, Amichai Dresner and Shai Forgash splitting the time during the regular season in the playoffs. Uh, Amichai Dresner got the bulk of the work in the regular season. Unfortunately for him, he came down with an injury come playoff time and Shia Forgash started pulling the reins for them. Although he did get a couple starts during the regular season as well. So he wasn't entirely new to the territory. And as I mentioned on the broadcast, Shai Forgash was the starting goalie on the JV TABC team that went undefeated and won the championship, had a perfect season during the 2023 or rather 2022-23 season. So it wasn't unfamiliar territory to him having to step up in the playoffs, play against teams. He played against SAR in his JV year, played against them this year in the playoffs, played against DRS in the championship and during the regular season when he was a 10th grader, started the championship game against them in the championship this year. And although they fell a little bit short, Certainly not to blame. Really, no one was to blame. DRS played a near perfect game, as did TABC. It was really just a matter of one or two bounces. And really, you know, also the fact with the empty net goal being one of those two bounces, it was just an outstanding finish um, to a phenomenal regular season. And although TABC fell a little bit short, certainly nothing to be disappointed in, at least from the success that they had during the regular season, all throughout the playoffs. And even in that championship game, you really just can't say. And I, I was saying this on the broadcast, in my mind, no particular team played worse than another. It was really just a matter of the fact that there was one bounce. A team didn't lose that game. One team stepped up and just won it. And Shai Forgash played a phenomenal championship game, and Amichai Dresner did a great job getting them there, putting them in position to be able to still have success, despite going with a guy in Forgash who didn't start mostly, you know, really all year long. Um, but, you know, he'll be back in net, I'm sure, for TABC next year on the varsity level, looking to run it back with the team that won it as a JV team when they went 10-0 and and won the championship. That'll be next year's varsity team on paper for TABC. It's going to be exciting to see what they do going forward. Now let's move on to the Eastern Conference. 
As for the Eastern Conference, so again, one more team in the Eastern than the Western Conference. We're going to start from the bottom and we'll work our way up towards the top. So we'll start at the bottom with Salman Schechter and North Shore. Salman Schechter and North Shore. And by the way, I didn't say this before, but something that is really worth mentioning is we've seen teams in the past you know, go throughout the entire regular season without getting a win, without seeming to play any competitive games. This year, every single team recorded at least one win. Every team recorded multiple close games, even with teams that, you know, even with the teams that only won one or two games or three games during the regular season, it really showed, you know, that this year, although I said last year's team, not this past year, but the year before's teams were deeper and probably had better, you know, better talent to some extent that I thought this league was a lot closer in competition just as a whole. But anyway, moving back on to the breakdown. So with Salman Schachter and North Shore, they finished right above each other in the standing. Salman Schachter finished in ninth. North North Shore finished in eighth. Salman Schachter going 2-12, 2 and 12 rather. North Shore going 3-11. and 11. Uh, Really just not much to look at there on the win column, but they both played competitively with just about every team they played with the exception of one or two absolute juggernauts. You know, you're looking at a team maybe like DRS or Hank or TABC or Frisch, you know, on the opposite side. So Those were really just the only games they really almost didn't have a shot in, or at least on the scoreboard, it it might, it may indicate that they didn't really have a shot in, but they played hard all year long. And two of these teams, again, or these two teams, I should say, specifically Salman Schachter and North Shore, both younger teams, guys mostly in the 10th and 11th grade class, both of these teams only had a varsity team this year, which allowed guys who were in the 9th and 10th grade level to be able to play on the varsity level because they only had that varsity team and kids can play up, but can't play down, uh, if that makes sense, age-wise. So it'll be interesting to see where they both go in terms of going forward and what will come of it next year. But there are definitely going to be two teams to watch out for that could be on the rise because they have a lot of young talent. As for YDE, YDE finished in seventh place. They went six and eight, were very close and really on the cusp of making the playoffs as well with a couple of favorable matchups earlier on in the year. However, late in the year. Did not really work out for them. Had to go up against Hank late in the season. Had to go up against TABC late in the season. And that was really the death blow for them when they couldn't squeak out any points there. You know, forget just wins in general. They were just really looking for one point here, one point there. See what they could do. You know, a tie, an overtime loss. Maybe they could shake something up in the standings. But unfortunately for them, it didn't work out. Uh, And unfortunately, they did not continue their playoff streak. However, next year, it'll be an interesting team. They just had a very productive JV year. As I said, a good mix of ninth and 10th graders. So those 10th graders will be moving up to play uh, varsity next year. And they definitely still have some good pieces from this past year's varsity team who are 11th graders who will definitely play a big role for them next year. So I'm interested to see where that team goes in terms of when they go forward for next year on the varsity level. As for the next team, Flatbush, they finished in sixth. Seven and seven on the dot during the regular season. They were right there in the playoff push and they just missed out by one point. They went seven and seven, had 14 points during the regular season. Rombaum, the last team that made it in from the fifth place or in the fifth in the fifth place position, had 15. And Flatbush lost a game to Rombaum. Or yeah, they did. Um, I'm not gonna say that was exactly where you say, oh, we should have taken, you know, another point or another win and gave it over because these two teams were really neck and neck all years. I'll get to Rambam very soon. But Flatbush, you know, a couple of games and, you know, I played witness to it just because I coached the middle school. So I was around that varsity team a lot, watching them play when uh, they would have games or, you know, games after our games or games after our practices. And uh, that Flatbush team definitely had pieces to make a run, but ultimately it was the also very similar, the the end to their regular season where, yes, they got the overtime win against Mag and David, and they had a chance to get into the playoffs because if they would have won that game in regulation, they would have had a chance. They needed a loss from Mag and David against YDE, and ultimately, and that also would have had to have been a regulation. In the end, it didn't end up mattering because they didn't win that game in regulation. Although they got the win, they won in overtime, and they needed Mag and David to miss out on points. And that was the reason that Flatbush ended up missing the playoffs. But they're going to have an interesting team next year, as I mentioned. Uh, you know, they they had pieces to make a run this year. And also, similar to North Shore and Solomon Schechter, this Flatbush team was a varsity team that had players on it grades 9 through 12. They have some very young talent on this team that didn't necessarily get to shine with the minutes that, you know, we had in term that that we had seen um in terms of the fact that they really had the bulk of their work being done by juniors and seniors, but they're an interesting team. 
Um, you know, they've got one of the top scorers amongst the juniors and Joe Catton. We know that who put up a ridiculously good season was right around the top in terms of goal scoring this year. Um, you know, 30 plus goals again, that is uh, really just incredible. And, uh, you know, they have some other pieces around, obviously guys like Omri Adolf, who's in that for them, who's going to be one of the better goalies in the league next year. Eli Gindy who's a hardworking four checker offenseman, but now added some defense to his game. Jaime Antibi is a tough body to move defensively, and he really just brings a great sense to the game. So it'll be interesting to see where they go going forward, but we'll have to wait and find out when that happens how far it's going to be. Uh, as for the team that finished in fifth in the regular season in the Eastern Conference, that would be Rambam. Rambam was the last team in the playoffs from the Eastern Conference seed-wise. They had a 7-6-1 and one record, but even though they only finished, and very similar to a situation where I would say sort of with SAR and MTA, although yes, they didn't have an outstanding record, a record wouldn't indicate that they had a very strong regular season. They played competitively with top teams in the league, played competitively with Hank, only lost by one there, played competitively with Hafter twice, took one of the two games that they played against them during the regular season. And ultimately, you're looking at this team and you're saying, you know, Again, the record didn't wow me, but they made it to the playoffs, had to go on the road to MTA and win a playoff game, and they managed to do that in pretty convincing fashion. They really just went in there and took control. Zevi Herskowitz, their captain, who I talked about in previous episodes during the regular season, very similar to Joe Catton, over 30 goals during the regular season. He was absolutely outstanding. He scored all five in that game. Rami Kesak, who I was talking about earlier on in the season, also one of the top goalies, if not the top goalie in the season, also a junior recorded a shutout in his first career varsity playoff game. And that is really something impressive all on the road, by the way. And with that being said, they were flying high, but then ran into DRS in the quarterfinals. And that's where it came to an end. They lost to DRS seven to one. So unfortunately it didn't end so well for them, but they had a very convincing season, at least compared to the fact that they had missed the playoffs the season before and really fell off the cliff early until they tried to do the work to get back in it late. And by that point, it was just too much for them to overcome. So a much more consistent season in terms of the success. And although it didn't end the way that they wanted it to, because obviously the goal for every team in the playoffs or really just ever is to make the championship, win the championship, uh, you know, definitely some bright spots there. And again, uh, guys from their 10th grade who will be moving up to play varsity on the level next year. I mentioned when I did the JV recap, they weren't such a deep team in the JV team, but guys like Moshe Holtz or Elon Klein will come up and play roles as well as Moshe Feldman and Isaac Mastery. And then other than that, they still have some pieces lying around from this year's varsity team, guys like Avril Rubin on offense and Rami Kessak, who's still going to be the goalie for them next year. You never know when you have a goalie like Rami Kessak, he could steal you a game here, a game there. I'm not saying that works out for 14, but I would expect them to at the very least play every game competitively next year because that's the way that this team is built. And if, you know, if they'll be able to sneak out wins, then they could be a, a very sneaky team next year on the varsity level. Moving on, we're going to go to the fourth team in the standings, Mag and David. Mag and David also seven, six, and one. They held the tiebreaker over Rombaum because they beat Rombaum during the regular season. And with that being said, this team had talent. They, I, I would say, had some of the most high-end talent in the league. They just weren't very deep. And another thing that really set them back is that they just weren't very incredibly disciplined. And that was a big problem for them earlier on in the season. Later on in the season, they were able to get their act together a little bit more and they were able to play more disciplined. And, you know, their coaching staff, you know, excuse me, their coaching staff did a great job of really just making sure that they were able to stay focused and play their game and not get, you know, lost in the thought of things that weren't really so relevant that, you know, could agitate them. And I talked about it earlier on in the episode when I said, listen, you know, when Robin was climbing up the standings right behind them and they were going to play them in the, you know, in the head to head game during the regular season, I said, look, Rambam has a couple of really good players on their team who all, you know, they'll feed off of Mag and David on the power play. If Mag and David takes a lot of penalties, you know, that could be their death sentence. And that was the game when they really turned it around. I don't remember what game for them that was during the regular season. However, I do know that it was rather late and they started really, you know, putting wins together at the end of the day. It, um, you know, it, it, I believe it was, uh, I, I want to say their ninth or their, their eighth or ninth game of the season. So, with that being said, you still have a, you know, it is 
halfway through the season, if not more at that point. And other than that, you still have some tough teams to beat. Remember, I already talked about the Flatbush game that even though they didn't win that game, you know, they got a point out of it. They clinched the playoffs by doing so, even though they didn't beat YDE the game after and they lost in regulation, it didn't matter because they did what they needed to do when they needed to do it. So with that being said, Mag and David ended up hosting SAR in the playoffs and then fell victim to SAR in the playoffs. Uh, I think SAR was the better team. And I think that they played the way they needed to play in order to beat Mag and David uh, for Mag and David. You know, I wasn't there. I heard that even though I mentioned they did a great job staying disciplined, I heard that there were some disciplinary issues and that they had trouble staying out of the box against SAR a team who's always been known for its great power play and their, you know, the way that they run it there. Um, and I heard they shot themselves in the foot there. I wasn't, again, I wasn't there to experience it, but you know, those were the reports that were coming to me from it. And, you know, unfortunately, as much talent as they may have had and as well coached as they may have been in terms of the strategy and the X's and O's, so to speak, it just didn't check out really mentality wise because you can't be taking playoffs, uh, excuse me, can't be taking penalties, especially in the playoffs as frequently as they were doing it at some point during the regular season. And really, I would say the shocker, if you would call it a shocker, is that this was after they had really settled in and started to play the way they needed to play. Cause Mag and David did not have a strong start to the season. At one point, I think they were in our prove it category, but then they jumped everyone in the standings and climbed up to the fourth seed from like the, you know, the eighth or seventh seed. So they jumped three or four spots in the playoff race and managed to host a playoff game. It was just such a shame that it ended up getting, you know, it ended up playing out the way that it did where they lost at home to SAR in the wild card game of the playoffs. Uh, as for the next team in the standings, that would be Hafter. Hafter went nine and five, very strong regular season, played some tough games against really, you know, played some tough games, even in games that they lost. Um, you know, there came a point in time when they had lost two really backbreaking games in terms of the way their schedule had laid out. And that was to Flatbush when they got absolutely dominated. I think the final score was five, one or six, one Joe Catton scored five goals in that game for Flatbush. He was absolutely brilliant. Um, and that Hafter team was missing players. They were missing Ernst. They were missing, you know, they were missing, uh, they were missing Alex Ernst. They were missing Jacob Wolf, two of their, really their more impactful players. And unfortunately they just didn't get a lot of offensive looks. Flatbush played them in Flatbush. So definitely the advantage to the Falcons there because they play in a rink. It's a tough, uh, it's a tough environment to adjust to sort of, especially for a team like Hafter or excuse me for a team like, uh, yeah, like for a team like Hafter that really just doesn't, um, you know, they're not used to playing in that same type of physical setting. You know, they play with the hard boards and the high glass in their rink or the fiberglass in their rink. But at the end of the day, or might be hard plastic, I honestly don't remember. But at the end of the day, when all was said and done, they were able to gut it out from there. They played tough game after tough game. They were the only team during the regular season that defeated DRS. So you got to give them credit where credit's due. Max Newmark, an outstanding regular season. Zach Newmark made the transition from offense to defense, played outstanding. Both of those guys are juniors next year. Those are two guys I'm looking at right now. And I'm saying, Newmark Twins, you are the pieces that this Hafter team is looking at right now and saying, how can we build around or how can we strategize for next year? Because very similar to Rami Kessock, Max Newmark, and if, if you know, whether or not – the debate is that him and Kessock are debatably one and two in the league in whatever order it's changing, you know, dependent on the games uh, – Max Newmark, just like Rami Kessock, has the ability to steal a game from anyone, you know, and I'm not saying that was the story of their season this year. He was very, very solid, very strong in just about every single game for them, really with the exception of the playoff game that they lost to Frisch when Hafter gave up eight goals. Now, that game was being live streamed, and then after that, it got cut off. So I don't know exactly how the rest of it unfolded. What I do know is that this is a team that's going to be hungrier coming into next year after a bit of a disappointing end after hosting a playoff game and then having to go on the road, or excuse me, not hosting a playoff game. They just went straight to the playoffs and having to go on the road to Frisch, a tough place to play in. And unfortunately for them, while it didn't end the way they wanted it to, I have a feeling they'll be back here next year and they are not going to be an easy team. And again, they'll be working towards that quest of winning a championship. That brings us to Hank. Hank finished in second in the Eastern Conference. Hank went 12 and two. And this, in my opinion, was the biggest shock of the regular season. And I'm not saying that because I didn't expect Hank to be good. I'm not, ex I'm not saying that because I didn't expect Hank to play competitively. I'm saying it because I don't think anyone expected Hank to play and have the amount of success they did. And it really just shows that A, 
their players did an excellent job really ignoring the rest of the league and what everyone else thought. It just shows you got to play the games because until you actually get results and until you actually play the games, you can't start counting wins and losses. It just doesn't work like that. They defied the odds to some extent. I will say that, but with players on that team like Elia Yitzhaki, Elon Kogel, and guys on the back end as well, like Jojo Talit and Avi Hackle, who came up as a ninth grader and played absolute lockdown defense, you know, after playing in middle school last year, absolutely brilliant. They were really anchored well by a good first starting line of seniors in Ellie Schwartz and Yoni Lovi, who made the transfer from DRS to come back to Hank after he went there for middle school, went to DRS to start high school and transferred back to Hank and coming back to play with the guys who he played with on that middle school team that won a championship. And then again, also their goaltending really did a great job. You know, I want to credit Josh Frankel, who was absolutely outstanding in between the pipes. And then Etai Holtzman, a freshman who came up and played in critical games for them and was absolutely brilliant. Again, this was a team that teams were sleeping on that other people as a whole were just sleeping on. And while they may have defied the odds to some extent, you definitely can't say they didn't deserve it because they worked very hard. And the second credit that goes to this team goes to their coaching staff. And really, Rabbi Harris did an absolutely outstanding job. I know a lot of people thought they lost guys like Jordan Gedgerman and uh, they lost guys like Jordan Gedgerman and Judah Ehrenhaus and Joey Diamond in net last year. And they were saying, you know, a lot's going to fall out the window for them. And I just didn't see it. I just didn't see it falling that much. A lot of people were thinking about this team that could, you know, be a team that would be able to compete. However, maybe their goaltending would be a little short, you know, compared to the rest of the league, or maybe their defense would fall a little short compared to the rest of the league. Not the case. They were outstanding, made it to the semifinals. They absolutely wiped the floor with Kushner. I just hate to say it. I was at that game and Kushner was good for about, you know, they played very evenly for the first five, six minutes of the first period. But I mentioned Kushner is not a very deep team and Hank was a deep team this year. They got production up and down the lineup from just about everyone, whether they were playing the entire game or if they weren't really playing at all. And at the end of the day, Hank just absolutely put their foot on the gas, put Kushner in a headlock and didn't let that foot off the gas or let them go out of that headlock until the game was over. And they ended up winning the game 7-1. Elliot's hockey with a brilliant offensive effort, assists, goals, beautiful breakaway goal. Um, you know, Elliot, excuse me, Etai Holtzman was absolutely phenomenal in that game for them. And again, while they did get that win, it did fall a little bit short for them, but I would expect them to be back next year because they're not really losing so much. With the exception, I would say like the two biggest impact players that they're losing that were huge, huge for this team this year. I, I don't want to deny that um, is really their first line offense, which was able to set the tone. They were fast. They were physical, not dirty, but they were physical. They played aggressive. They really got teams sort of almost softened up a little bit. And that allowed them to open the door for guys like Yitzhaki and Kogel on the second line, so to speak. And those two guys weren't exactly guys who should have been playing second line on almost any other team. They'd be playing first line minutes as well. And they're going to have a lot of those pieces back for next year. Avi Hackle's only going into his second year of high school. He's going to be outstanding again. Jojo Talit's going to step up and play even bigger minutes. Guy like Isaac Silberger is going to start to see more time again next year after he started seeing time down the stretch. And again, this is not a team that necessarily will have championship aspirations next year, but I think after, especially after what happened this past season, no one is going to be underrating them coming into next season. And they have certainly earned a lot more respect, at least I would say, heading into what will be next season, but we won't know until we get there. Um, as for the final team in the Eastern Conference and in the entire varsity league, we have the DRS Wildcats, the eventual champions of this past season. DRS had a record of 13 and one during the regular season. Their only loss came to Hafter. As I mentioned, that was in Hafter on a Saturday night. And the most important thing I would say that, or not the most important thing that that's not really the right word, but I would say the most obvious or the most eye appealing thing about this team was their defense and how they were always playing a defense first game, always had a defense first mindset. And that was really the key to their season. It was the key to their season two years ago when this team was on the JV level and they won the championship them and they lost some players or they lost a, at least lost some players who were playing bigger roles for them. Guys, you know, a guy like Shmuel Fine would be a good example of how he was on the second line playing heavy minutes as a defenseman and JV didn't even play hockey this past year and they still won the championships. And with that, 
guys stepped in and filled roles who weren't necessarily seeing so much time on the JV level. A guy like Micha Khan would be a good example. Ellis Bornstein shifted from offense to play defense. They got guys step up on the front end like Moshe Ari and Jack Greenbaum, who were both huge for that JV team last year and ended up being, I would say, the most effective line in the entire Yeshiva League and the Varsity League this past year with their speed, their skill, and their vision. And it was really despite the fact that they're both two players who are a bit undersized compared to the rest of the league. And that didn't bother them. They scored the, they scored one of the goals in the game against TABC in the championship. The one that was the empty netter, but really just played almost a suffocating. I know that they're offensemen, but really suffocated TABC's offense by not being able or rather not, not being able, but not allowing TABC to get possession of the ball the way they forechecked and the way that they were able to, so to speak, kill penalties. They were both on the penalty kill and huge for them this past year. So that was a big step up on their end. They're both juniors, by the way. They will definitely be back next year, and they're going to be as impactful, if not more, than they were this year. Uh, and with that being said, can't take away, obviously, I mentioned this team's defense, can't take away from guys like Jake Frankel and obviously their leader and captain, Nathaniel Lawrence, who was absolutely brilliant on the back end for them this year and didn't exactly have the same impact offensively as he may have had in years past because he's always been known to be a defenseman who can lock it down. But if you caught the interview that I had with him in the first year of Yeshiva League Pass face-off, and I said, listen, you were a huge goal scorer for your team, despite the fact that you were a defenseman. And why did that change in the championship two years ago? Because he didn't score goals in the championship on the JV level against TABC. And he said, yeah, I really wanted to focus on play defense, on playing defense. I just wanted to play defense and not have to worry about scoring because I felt that was really where the team needed the most help in terms of or where they needed me to be mostly, you know, because I felt com- because I felt confident in the offense and defense. And I said, wow, you know what? That's really a great job by A, him, B, his coaching staff, for realizing they could play that matchup. And the same thing happened for the entirety of this regular season. He was always a guy who was a threat to score whenever he had the ball on his stick. But at the same time, he was absolutely locked down very, very possibly. And I would certainly vote him as the best defenseman in the entire varsity league this past year. He was absolutely brilliant. And that's not a knock on anyone else. It's just showing how incredibly talented and not just how incredibly talented he is with his ability, but also with the mental side of the game, not choosing to only make skill plays and to play fundamentally sound defense because he has a lot of skill. And he had a lot of skill playing this entire season, his entire career, but it was the choice of his to make the fundamental play first. And then if skill takes over, skill takes over when he gets the opportunity. And that's a very important attribute to have as a player. And it was really just incredible to see what he was able to do, had the assist on the game winning goal to Max Pachris during the regular season, uh, not the regular season in the championship. And that play really was the only play that you could say If you want to say TABC really just like, you know, that was the thing that came back to mind that they didn't clear the zone. And by the way, we're not talking about weak opportunities to clear the zone. It was a heck of a keep, you know, leaping in the air, catching it, putting it down with his stick. So the hand pass would be negated. It was a brilliant play. And again, really just like no fault towards anyone there. It was just a matter of the one bounce that ended up being the deciding factor in that championship game. And also don't want to take away from guys like Daniel Austin either because he was absolutely brilliant again. And he pitched a shutout in his second consecutive championship game against, or not a shutout the first time. So excuse me there, but he did pitch a shutout. And, you know, we've seen some of these brilliant goaltending performances, especially in the championship game, how the goalie, not that he was necessarily bombarded with shots, but he faced his fair share of quality looks and he kept everything out of the net. He was great when he needed to be. He was great despite all the adversity saying, Oh, TABC lost to DRS during the regular season, five, nothing. And, you know, it's going to be over. They're not going to get anything because TBC found a way to really work DRS hard in that championship game. And Austin definitely saw a lot more work in that championship game than he did during the regular season meeting when the two teams met. Everyone had the expectations pretty much by that point when they played during the regular season that TABC and DRS were going to be the two remaining teams when it came time for the championship. And we got a great game out of it. And again, while it didn't end well for TABC, they definitely had a great season overall. But ultimately, as we're talking about DRS right now, it was really the way that they played that ended up giving them a very successful regular season, successful run through the playoffs to the championship and winning the championship that 
really was the catalyst of it all. And again, while, you know, I do want to say, you know, hats off to all of these teams who gave us a great season. I also do need to say it now that we're talking about DRS to close it out. Congratulations to the DRS Wildcats on winning that varsity championship. And these will be two teams specifically now that I sort of touched on it, that I would definitely say you'd expect to see back here next year because next year's varsity teams will be the year from 2022-2023 season's JV teams. And in that JV championship, both TABC and DRS were the two teams that made it to the championship. So this could very well be a preview for what we might see coming forth during the next regular season and the next championship that we see. But only one way to find out, and that's to experience it, as I've said numerous times before on many different episodes before. So with that being said, we're going to wrap it up here. Thank you all so much for tuning into this episode of Yeshiva League Pass Faceoff. And again, I want to thank our sponsor, the Weiselberg Law Firm, reminding everybody once again, please choose wisely.